Now for something completely technical. I'm going to describe work that I did with Dr. Sen Godin on how to detect landmines using mathematical techniques. Most countries have now signed up to a treaty banning landmines, but 61 countries in the world are still contaminated by them and they're killing more than 20 people a day. They've been left over from a number of wars. The map here shows some countries where casualties were reported from landmines and the countries in red had a hundred or more casualties from landmines. At the moment a number of states India, China, Pakistan, Russia, the United States still have large stops, stocks of these weapons even though they've been prohibited by international treaty. The UN is working on clearing landmines in a large number of countries. Um, you can see the, see the ones involved here mainly around Africa and the Middle East, but also in Colombia. There are three main methods of detecting them. The, the oldest is to use induction, where you, you have a coil of a tuned circuit, the end of a stick. Um, as that coil is moved near any piece of metal, it induces currents in the piece of metal which changes the inductance of the coil and the frequency of oscillation of the tuned circuit alters. You then mix that with a reference stable oscillator and you get an audio tone generated. They're not effective for non-metal mines and it's obviously dangerous for the operator to do this kind of thing. More recently, people have started to train animals, dogs, even rats, to smell explosives and uh, detect them that way. And that will work with anything that contains explosive. But obviously it's dangerous to dogs and also to handlers, just like the um, induction loop on a stick is. More recently, radar has been developed, ground penetrating radar which depends on the reflection of microwaves from inhomogeneities in the underlying soil and it can pick up a variety of objects under the soil, both metallic and non-metallic. I've got a picture here of someone working by hand but these kinds of um, devices can also be carried on robots, either a tracked robot like this or a a small drone. These are uh, the ones shown here are Cobham ones. This is inherently safer for an initial scan since the robots can detect them without putting anyone in danger and if you have the right kind of robot the robot can remove the mine by a controlled explosion. So radar techniques would be preferred but they're very hard to interpret if you just use an ordinary ground penetrating radar and run it along the ground you get really weird pictures with lots of curves and apparently lots of layers. It's very hard to make out what you're seeing. These types of pictures are called in the ground penetrating radar terminology a B scan. An A scan is what you get if you hold the radar in one position and just get and echo back at various depths. A B scan is what you get if you scan the, the radar across the ground. For an archaeologist that would typically occur with a, a wheeled device rolling it across but you obviously can't use a wheeled device for landmine detection. Now why don't you get a nice picture like on a ship's radar? I mean th th this type of radar set is a planned position indicator and when you're on a ship and read th those radars you see things which are clearly recognizable as islands, other ships and it looks just like a map. 
why doesn't ground penetrating radar give you this kind of nice picture? Well, basically it's because they don't have a parabolic reflector to give you a narrow beam. Uh, a radar that gives a picture like that uses a parabolic reflector to send out a narrow beam. It then rotates and as it rotates it gets echoes back at different positions. But ground penetrating radar doesn't work that way. It's not big enough to have a, a big um, reflector. You just have the waveguide going the, from the microwave source going directly to the ground. As a result of this, even perfectly small round objects appear as distributed curves. Now why is this? Suppose I'm in this position here, directly above an object. Well, I'll get an echo back at a depth y. If I move it across to the side, radar waves coming from position P1 spread out and also get echoed back at distance h. So it appears on my set that there's something underneath me at distance h. And as I move further to the side, this distance increases so the thing appears to be further down. And what you get is a hyperbolic curve. Typical shape here. That's done with a very simple trace. And that's because the radar waves have spread out in all directions. They're not going down in a narrow beam. They're spreading out in all directions and you're getting echoes back from multiple sources. And you're getting echoes back from things further back on your track but also things in front and behind the current scan that you're, you're performing. How can you remove this? Well, the technique that Dr. St. Gordon and I developed goes through four steps. You first simulate what a, a pure point reflector would do. You form a 3D kernel from this. By a 3D kernel, I mean a three-dimensional array of data which corresponds to the strength of reflection you would have got from this ideal um, reflector. You sweep this kernel over the data you've collected as you scanned, correlating as you go, and finally you form a density surface. The simulation phase says, tries to say, suppose I had a one-inch metal sphere at a certain depth in the soil. Typically we would we choose depths around six centimeters. And we simulate the image that you would get from a perfect ground penetrating radar if such a thing was under the soil and there was nothing else there. This as I say we form a 3D kernel that is a three-dimensional array storing this image. I'm just giving you a 2D slice through it there. Now, I've said a B scan is an image like this. What the uh, ground penetrating radar community call a C scan is the result of packing a series of successive B scans one after the other to form a three dimensional slice through the ground. Now what we do is we take our kernel and sweep it through the three dimensions. And at each possible position, each pixel position that you can sweep it through, we correlate the kernel with the C-scan. And we get an output image, where e a three-dimensional output image, where each point in it corresponds to the degree of correlation that we got between the kernel and the actual scan data. We're using a standard Pearson correlation co coefficient here. We're using correlation because we've done experiments to show that we get a much clearer image using correlation than you do using simple convolution. Here are some of the results we get. And it's quite remarkable the degree of detail you can see. This was a, a browning pistol with a wooden grip metal casing imaged under the ground and you can clearly pick out the shape of the, the pistol. This is a plastic 
Mouse anti-personnel mine and you can clearly pick that out too. Metal anti-personnel mine, the shape is again clearly visible, the, the large rim at the top appears there. It also works against non-metallic targets. This is a glass landmine developed by Colombian guerrillas and we're able to pick up the neck and upper part of the, la the landmine very clearly. You can see it clearly represents the, set, the shape of it. Again this is a, another metallic anti-personnel mine of a different design. This is just a metal plate that was placed in the ground for test purposes, for co comparison. Even a wooden mine here is, is detected successfully. Uh, it's not surprising this one's detected, it's another steel cased one, another metal one here. So, and this is an entirely plastic anti-personnel mine, again picked up and easily detected. What we're getting here are actually three-dimensional pictures below the ground of the objects that have been discovered. So what we can say is that combination of simulation and three-dimensional correlation can give accurate images of underground mines. If this is combined with drone scanning, it should make the detection and clearance of the minefields which are a huge hazard to life in many countries substantially safer. We've released all these techniques into the public domain and they're described in the thesis specified down there.